I'm Jason Palmer, one of the hosts of The Intelligence, The Economist's daily current affairs podcast. The Economist's award-winning shows make sense of what matters, from our special series on China's president to our weekly podcasts on business, technology, and American politics. Our journalists provide fair, in-depth reporting on the events shaping the world. Search for Economist Podcasts Plus and sign up to our free one-month trial. It's time to say goodbye to hold music and say hello to fast customer support with Service Cloud. With trusted AI and data working together, you can skip long wait times and deliver efficient, personalized service right away. All while keeping support costs low and more customers happy. Reimagine your customer support with the number one AI CRM for service. Learn what's possible at Salesforce.com/products/service. At Granger, we're for the ones who specialize in saving the day, and for the ones who've mastered the art of keeping business moving. We offer industrial-grade supplies for every industry, with same-day pickup and next-day delivery on most orders, all backed by real people ready to help. So you can get the right answers and products right when you need them. Call clickgranger dot com or just stop by. Granger for the ones who get it done. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast, your go to source for personal, professional, and organizational growth and development. We hope you tune in often for all things people management, organizational development and change, organizational leadership, and social impact related. Maximize your personal and organizational potential with Human Capital Innovations podcast. Welcome to the Human Capital Innovations podcast. In this HCI podcast episode, I talk with Jack Mardak about how HR leaders can address changing employee expectations in a distributed world. Jack Mardak, welcome to the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. Thank you, Jonathan. Extremely excited to be here with you today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule. I'm excited to have a nice conversation today. We're going to be exploring how HR leaders can address changing employee expectations in a distributed world. I mean, there's just so much going on right now、uh, in terms of virtual work, hybrid work, distributed workforce. A lot of this accelerated by the pandemic,、uh, and a lot of things that organizational leaders have to grapple with as they're trying to figure out what makes the most sense for them and for their teams,、uh, and navigate. Shifting employee expectations.、Uh, it, we know also right now that it's、uh, it's a, it's a really tight labor market,、uh, and so employees have options,、uh, and so or you know leaders are having to kind of wrestle with you know what their employees want versus what they want, and sometimes those aren't aren't in line,、uh, and the realities of just. Uh, how to deal with the labor market supply demand issues?、Um, as we get started, I wanted to share Jack's bio with everybody. Jack Mardak is deeply inspired by the power of software to change the world and make it a better place. He's been very lucky to get to work alongside some incredibly talented folks. And to have had a modest hand in several exceptional outcomes, Jack is presently co-founder at Oyster and working on removing the barriers of global employment. Oyster is the HR platform for globally distributed companies, and their mission is to remove the barriers between talented people and great full-time jobs at a global scale. They believe it should be easy for any company to hire any person, no matter where either is located in the world. And I think that is awesome,、uh, a very much needed service. And definitely something that uh, uh, I'm excited to explore with you today.、Uh, before we really launch on into the conversation, anything else you would like to share with listeners by way of background or personal context?、Uh, thank you for the kind introduction,、uh, John. I, th- I think you covered it well.、Uh, you explained what Oyster is. We are the purpose-built HR platform for globally distributed companies, and、uh, our, our mission is to create a more equal world. By allowing companies、uh, everywhere to hire people anywhere, as we believe that 
there's a tremendous opportunity here for for positive impact in the world uh, as well, and and we're we're very excited about that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And again, given given the pandemic, I mean, we already saw a a trajectory towards increasing virtual work and increasing distributed workforce. Um, that just got accelerated due to the pandemic and people working, you know, really anywhere they wanted to. And almost overnight, a flip of a switch, um, you know, teams going virtual. And we've also seen this trajectory of the rise of the gig economy. And there's other platforms out there that help uh, organizations line up to rent talent, to get gig workers to come in, you know, in different functional areas and uh, areas of expertise. And so those have been around for a while. Um, what we really do need though, is, you know, if, if I'm, I'm based here just South of Salt Lake city in Utah, uh, if I'm a global company, uh, what's keeping me from hiring the best talent from anywhere in the world, especially if my team has already gone remote. Why does it matter whether they live in Utah, in California, New York, in India, China, wherever? It doesn't matter. Uh, and I think more and more organizations are recognizing that, realizing it. Um, of course, it, this does come, distributed workforce does come with its own set of challenges and obstacles. Uh, but having, having platforms like yours out there to help uh, line those things up for organizations and employees um, it, it's a wonderful thing. Uh, so let's let's start by talking about some of those challenges. Uh, what do you see as some of the biggest uh, roadblocks, the biggest challenges facing distributed teams, and how are you and your team at Oyster trying to address those? Sure. Well, the the main theme here is that functioning as a distributed company, a company that doesn't rely on offices. Is, is only uh, uh, possibly successful if undertaken in an extremely thoughtful uh, and deliberate way. One of the themes that, that has emerged uh, uh, as a result of the, of the pandemic is what I'm calling the, the exposure of the, the, the lack of ownership of the, expo- of the employment experience, right? And so um, if you'd ask someone who, who owns sort of the, the, the experience that you're having a, a, as an employee, is it facilities because they've given you the, 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 the floor space, your cubicle? Is it IT because they've furnished you with a laptop and given that comes installed with a number of collaboration tools? Uh, and so yank the, the rug out uh, from under that uh, office-based experience. And it was very clearly exposed that really no one is, is purposefully uh, owning this. And so one of the, um, one of the findings of a, of a future of HR report that we recently published together with 451 Research is that HR is now firmly going to emerge as the owner and excitingly the designer of how uh, people work. And so uh, whether that is uh, an office-based choice uh, or whether that is a hybrid uh, uh, scenario or whether that is fully distributed, knowing that in each in each form, what we now need is, is very purposeful and deliberate design, right? So under that framework, the, the challenges of distributed work, of fully distributed organizations who have no, who have no uh, offices to rely on uh, begin with a, a purposeful design of how that company wants to work. And so we've, we've set down that path ourselves uh, at Oyster. Uh, we started down this path before the pandemic. We were very uh, inspired by the, the success of, of some of the pioneers of remote working, GitLab, um, uh, Automatic, Buffer, a host, a host of others who've been saying, this is amazing, there, there are benefits here. That, that, that y'all are not appreciating uh, from, from your perspective. So we were, we were very much bought into that. And so the, the journey for us began with, uh, with uh, installing uh, a head of remote. Uh, our, our, um, our, our people team has been designed from the ground up with this aim in mind. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't assume that, that our way of working would be merely an adaptation of office-based work. And so it was a blank sheet of paper. Very exciting, but also kind of scary, uh, and and we've literally designed how we work from from the ground up, and that is an approach that we are prescribing to others who are interested in the benefits of fully distributed organizations. And we've got we've got lots of, of yeah. content and material to support companies on that journey. Yeah, well, I, I really like your emphasis on how this needs to be a unique 
ongoing conversation within each team, within each organization, uh, because there's really not a one size fits all approach to how we're going to yeah. design work. I, I think I would say that generally, uh, whether you're in person, hybrid, remote, whatever, um, there's no one size fits all to, to what you know an effective workplace looks like. And certainly in a dis- with a distributed team, I, I think that applies even more because you just have people potentially from all different uh, backgrounds, even more than some of the most diverse workforces um, that you might already ex- see and experience in the U.S. Um, with a truly distributed team. I mean, the, the, the sky's the limit in terms of how diverse um, your team can be. And so it, it's so much just depends on the, on the makeup of the team and, and what your core values are and what your core mission is, what your object, uh, objectives are and what you're trying to accomplish. And so just, I, I mean, that probably sounds like a no brainer. Like, yeah, of course you need to tailor yeah. this and make what, it unique to each organization. What's really interesting is uh, if you think about the way, and, and let's focus on knowledge work, right? Because obviously um, flipping burgers or being a security guard in front of a door is, is less transformed by all of this. And so we're, we, we know that we're, what we're talking about here is, is knowledge work. And if you think about office-based knowledge work, startlingly uh, um, similarities, startling lack of differentiation in the very different kinds of work. A bank looks a lot like a software company, uh, right? In terms of how people are working, they, they sit at their desk, they have, they have a laptop, they go into conference rooms, and, and there's all this unreviewed inertia uh, about how work happens in an office that I, that I think is now, in retrospect, looking back from this, from this remove, sh- rather shocking. Uh, contrast that with what I now think will be the, the the much more purposeful building designing of how a company works in, in alignment with what they're working on. And I, and I think that's not a way of thinking that has been uh, in organizations up until now. So that's really exciting. Well, yeah, I mean, it, there's just, like you said, there's been so much inertia um, that nobody's really been challenging the norms and the tradition of, of what we do and how we do it, right? We just continue to do it the way, why? Yes. Because we've always done it that way. Well, now for, you know, this, this, disrupt, this disruptive period over the course of the pandemic has given us an opportunity to step back and to really just rethink things. And so many of the things that we did traditionally were just stupid. Maybe they served, a, a you know, they had a value and, and served um, a point at one point in time, but, you know, in, in the modern age, they just aren't necessary anymore. And so for, you know, for the first time for many people, I think this is an opportunity to really rethink that. So I, I completely agree. I think that's really, really important. Um, you, so you also talk about this value shift. Um, yes. You know, the, the value shift as a result of the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Maybe provide yes. a couple examples, what yeah. we're seeing in terms of the value shift of organizations and individuals. Totally. So the, the disruption of behavior at, at macro scale uh, gave us all the, the opportunity to make do with less uh, and, and review what's really uh, important to us. And also to, to also observe very directly the impacts on the environment, on other systems of this dramatic scale down and what had been sort of our, our fervent, energetic way of working unreviewed for such a long time, right? And so the, the, the value shift begins to creep in as people start to think differently about what they care about, uh, the, the importance of work-life balance, the, the importance of working uh, for an organization whose values they believe in and are aligned with, uh, giving uh, patronage as consumers to organizations and companies whose, whose values uh, we, we are uh, aligned with. And so I think there's, there's sweeping behavioral change that, that touching on consumer behavior, touching on how employers behave, touching on how employees think about uh, you know, who they go to work for, S- sweeping uh, change is, is coming across, uh, across all of that. For, um, for, for organizations, this, this has been a lot of discussion recently about the great resignation. The great resignation is, is not about the logistics of work. It's not about the where. Sure, considerations about work flexibility is a, is a component of that. It's one of those things that people want now, not, not as an end to itself, because they realize that they, they do like being there at 3 p.m. for homework with, with your child, 
right? That 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 has become suddenly really really important, and you want to give you want to give emphasis to that. And and uh, they're also thinking differently about uh, getting meaning uh, from work. And that is what's driving. I think everyone thinking is like you know. Uh, screw this! I'm I'm fed up with uh, not not feeling the way that that I that I realize I can feel about uh, the things that I give my day to, uh, including including your your employment. And I, I think that's that's very important for employers to absorb uh, and to digest. And and I think that there are there are very important and and large implications for the HR function as a result as they think about not just. The work flexibility and the wear uh, of work, but also the basic posture that that employers take to the wellness of employees. I think as Americans, we're, we're accustomed to benefits being sort of this net, this contingency. Into you know, if something happens, if I get sick, when I need you know uh, a dental care, etc. I think that's going to change now into a more more active, continuous way of thinking about the wellness of your employees, checking in, uh, engagement being much more important, providing access to resources like like um, mental uh, health professionals, for example, as a part of the of the benefits packages and perks packages that that employers are putting are putting together. I'm excited to announce the publication of my new book from HCI Press, Bluer Than Indigo Leadership, The Journey of Becoming a Truly Remarkable Leader. Early in my adult life, I learned about an Asian proverb that translates as bluer than indigo. If you think about the color indigo, it is a brilliant, deep, and vibrant blue, what some would call the bluest of blues. To have something that is bluer than indigo is rare and truly remarkable. Contrary to popular myth, there is no one-size-fits-all or cookie-cutter approach to effective leadership. There's no silver bullet, no secret sauce, no go-to model that will solve all of our problems. The truth is, great leaders have all had their unique strengths and flaws, and have all had to discover and then pave their own distinctive path in their life's journey to fulfill their leadership potential. Bluer Than Indigo Leadership will help you discover your own path and explore those ordinary, everyday actions that will help you respond to an uncertain future and produce extraordinary results for individuals, teams, and organizations. Yeah, and, and certainly I, one of the, the positive things that has come out of the pandemic is, is for many organizations and many leaders, I think they've recognized the the humanity of of the situation right and just the challenges that people are facing and juggling all these different things and trying to balance and just the mental health strains on many individuals um i've seen so many leaders really step up to the plate to try to do those check-ins and to help people know that they're supported and that they're cared about um i and that's that's really important and i agree i think in time that will just become more and more the norm, nor more and more the expectation of what it means to be a good, uh, effective leader and to, to manage your team and to, and to care for and take care of your people. Um, so I, I think that's a, that would be a good change. And you look at, you know, for example, the U S how benefits are perceived in the U S versus other parts of the world. I mean, depending on your, your kind of philosophical point of view, your, uh, your social, your social point of view, you know, you could see that as better or worse, but definitely there's, there's, uh, there's many countries uh, that for a long time have supported employees in many ways that are much more significant than how we've done it in the U S for a long time. Um, So whether you think that's a good thing or a bad thing, I mean, I'll leave that up to you, but um, I I think what we also see is just the trend of, yeah, we, we, as employees expect more of our employers, uh, and you know, I, I find it funny too. I'm, I'm a professor, so I, you know, I, I teach, you know, in a corporate setting, but I also teach at the university. And uh, so often, I hear people talk about uh, these darn millennials or Gen Z workers who, you know, they just want feedback and they want um, they want opportunities for advancement, and they they have all these expectations, and they're so entitled. 
And when I when I hear the things that my students, my younger students say about what they hope to see from their employers or, you know, the problems that they see in their current employers, it's it's like I don't see a problem there. I just see people having yes. realistic expectations for what good leadership is <laughs> and, and, and no longer are they yes. willing to put up with crappy jobs and crappy leaders, jerk bosses, people who don't know how to actually do the things we're talking about to, to be effective in the workplace. They just have a higher expectation than maybe previous generations did, especially when they're starting out. And I don't think that's entitlement. I think that's just, they've learned what good management and leadership is, and they expect to see it. Um, and so whether that's in a distributed workforce or that's in an in-person office setting, you know, they, they want to see their people rise to the challenge and they're not willing to put up with a crappy job. They're not willing to put up with, you know, uh, 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 tasks that have no meaning or purpose. They want fulfillment in the work they do. They want opportunities for growth and they want opportunities to make a difference, to make an impact in the world around them. And the truth is, we can design jobs that way. Uh, there, there are, I mean, you can take companies. Yeah. You can de- design companies that way. You can design jobs that way. Um, and it's not just white collar types of work, knowledge work. I mean, you can make, you can design blue collar work, um, industrial work, farming work. You can, you can design work to be more meaningful and impactful uh, and to have value, intrinsic value for individuals you just have to be thoughtful about it. Uh, and I've seen organizations do this time and time again, uh, where they, where they've been able to transform when they take the time to really think about it, ask their employees what they need and want, um, what's going to be motivating to them, et cetera. And in a distributed world, uh, in a, in a virtual world, I think this is as important as ever because I'm not just fighting for talent within my little geographic location. I, as an employer, I'm going to be fighting for talent globally. Anyone exactly. can work for anyone. And, and that brings up a lot of opportunities, but also a lot of uh, challenges in terms of the, the battle for talent, right? Yes. It, it's, it's great to, to hear you characterize the, the, what had been sort of the, the millennial whine or the millennial complaint as, as now revealed as really being a thirst for meaning. And, and among the things that, that the pandemic has clarified is I, I think it's going to clarify that millennial narrative and show that millennials were just sort of ahead of the curve a little bit in being the, the first generation to, to, to realize, you know, I, I want more from my employment experience. And, and the pandemic has, has been a catalyst and I think has, has distributed that attitude now, now more broadly than, than just millennials, which is, which is very exciting. Another thing that has been, that has been uh, catalyzed by the pandemic that's extremely relevant here is is there will be more impact driven meaning driven mission driven companies that are coming into existence as a result of this values shift i think that 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 reflects a, a number of different factors we we have uh for a, a few years now been able to observe that um positive impact at scale commercial success at scale can uh, in fact uh, intersect and I think uh, as a result of the pandemic, there's going to be a lot more companies that try to design themselves. Oyster is one to, that try to design themselves that way so that their their success commercially is in line and aligned with and tracking at similar scale with the, the impact that, that they are having uh, in the world. So I think there will be more companies that, that come into existence with, with purpose uh, at their center so as to better connect with the talent in the world that is now so much more uh, interested in, in giving their time, giving their precious energy and effort to companies that, that matter to them, that are trying to make a difference in the world. Yeah, and again, I mean, this, this isn't new. Nothing we're saying is like, earth shattering, like nobody's yes. ever talked about it before. It's the acceleration. It's yes. the acceleration. I've been doing research in this area for about a decade and a half. And I've seen, you know, very clear, uh, persistent desire from employees for decades uh, based on uh, social science research, survey research and such, um, that meaning purpose fulfillment, the desire that your work has impact in the world around you. Like that's been a really important factor for people for generations. Um, but it's, it's just become more and more salient and more and more of an expectation um, as we've come into recent years. And over the last decade, we've just seen that 
um, go up even more and more and the rise of the triple bottom line and corporate social responsibility narratives and stakeholder yes. capitalism and, you know, uh, uh, social impact investing and like all these things have contributed to the, to the narrative that people just want what they do to have significance to the world around them. And, and they expect their employer to provide those opportunities. And if they don't, they're going to go either start their own business or do gig work where they get to completely choose how and where and when they're going to do work for whom, um, or, you know, they're, 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 they're going to demand more from their employers. And so this, this purpose-driven work is, is just so important. I completely agree. It's not new. It, we've just seen the trend um, accelerating yes. in recent years, and it's going to continue um, as we can, as we move forward. And so I, I suppose this kind of gets me into my last question uh, for today, which is, you know, what are those, the must have benefits that the, the new generation of knowledge workers are looking for? Clearly they want flexibility. Clearly they want purpose-driven work. Um, maybe you can elaborate on that or anything else sure. that you see. Sure. So uh, to build on the, the traditional list of, of benefits in insurance, I think those things are not going away. So I think we're, we're, we're looking at a net expansion in the scope of benefits where we're building on what we've had historically uh, in, in, terms of, in terms of benefits. And in the, in the case of office-less fully distributed companies where it certainly isn't the ping pong table, it certainly isn't the, the, the stocked jar of gummy bears uh, on, on the counter in the kitchen. Those things are, are absolutely uh, irrelevant at this point. So it's, it's a new set of things that employers will come up with to take care of their people where they are. And that includes uh, equipment, um, ensuring that they have uh, the right access to Wi-Fi uh, and internet. Uh, it could be uh, incremental stipends so that they can do things like ha have a lunch out uh, on the company or enjoy a, a delivered meal or some other a perk that is more present, that is more sort of day-to-day -day, as opposed to this entirely abstract idea. Very important, but this very abstract notion of I'm insured in case uh, in case anything, anything happens. Uh, I think a big piece of that is going to be uh, caring about mental health I think we're 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 in the midst of a of a transformation in the perception, the perceptions around we're all we should all just admit that we're all sufferers and that we all have our issues and we all need to lean, and and our employers should be the shoulder there, uh, when when we have when we have those needs that that are so universal across uh, across all all all, uh, all kinds of workers, so I, I think so, those are some of the things that are that are rising in in importance now. Yeah, and I completely agree. Uh, and, you know, some may say, well, why, why does this, is this the employer's responsibility? Why should they have to do this? I'm like, well, I, on the one hand, it's a simple labor market supply demand question. <laughs> like, like, how are you going to attract and retain the best people? Um, and, and you got to provide what people demand. Um, but it's also the, the human case of it all. And, and just more and more, I think, uh, leaders and employees alike recognizing that, yeah, this this is important for everybody. This and the is about the value of human capital, and it's full, exactly it's full realization. Exactly, happens. and and so we can't look past this. We can't just say, "Well, this isn't our responsibility." They should do that. Um, you know, companies need to step up to the plate. Well, Jack, it has just been a real pleasure. Uh, I imagine we could go on and on and on um, because there's so much we could unpack here, but um, I need to let you uh, get on with your busy day. So before we wrap up for today, and you're welcome back anytime, please uh, feel free Thank to you, join John. me again. But before we wrap up for today, uh, any uh, final word and, and just let people know how they can get connected with you and, and your team. Sure. So I'll, I'll, I'll give shout outs to, to two um, two cohorts, if you will, to prospective impact entrepreneurs, I would say be inspired. There's never been a more opportune moment to create a company that is about making a difference in the world. There are a number of factors in your favor. Now, uh, the democratization of access to talent and capital uh, impact investment as a, as, a, as a source of capital is ready uh, and smart now and knows how to recognize uh, businesses that have that, that potential. And so I would I would encourage them uh, to, to pursue that. And I, I also want to uh, give a shout of, of encouragement to people leaders, to HR leaders. I think we're, we're on the threshold of a renaissance of HR, where if, if, we, if we look back on what, uh, what just happened to IT over the last 10 years, 
uh, as a result of the the value uh, the value opportunities represented by the shift to the cloud and by the um, the development of value from data. Very similar journey, I think, is is afoot now for the HR function, where talent is is the data. Talent is now the thing that finally, my gosh, and we've been saying it as a platitude, you know, human capital is a company's most important assets. I think that becomes true in the 2020s. And I think it is HR that, that leads that charge. And so I would say, be, be encouraged, be very inspired. Please visit us at uh, oysterhr.com. We have lots of, of inspirational and educational and insight-filled content aimed at exactly that transformation narrative for HR. So I would encourage you to, to check that stuff out. And as far as being in touch with me, I'm, I'm Jack at Oyster HR, happy to engage. You can ping me as well uh, on LinkedIn. And this was a, a total pre- a pleasure, Jonathan. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jack. It has been a pleasure. I encourage listeners to reach out, get connected, find out more about Oyster, uh, connect with Jack, find out what he and his team can do for you. And as always, I hope everyone can stay healthy and safe, that you can find meaning and purpose at work each and every day. And I hope you all have a great week. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership. Ordinary, everyday actions that produce extraordinary results. Consider how the nature of work has shifted over the past 50 years. With increased globalization, rapid technological advancement, and the shift in economic composition, the average job of today looks very different than the average job of 50 years ago. What will the jobs and organizations of tomorrow look like? Moreover, what does this all mean for organizational leaders? What are the core competencies and capabilities of organizations and their leadership that are prepared for continued disruption and geopolitical and socioeconomic shifts? Regardless of what the future holds, increasingly, leaders need to be socially minded, data driven, decisive, champions of talent, and disruptors of the traditional notions of leadership, teams, organizations, and work. The alchemy of truly remarkable leadership will help you to explore your own leadership competencies and capabilities and consider ways to apply and implement them into your workplace and personal life. Check out Human Capital Innovations magazine, Human Capital Leadership. Human Capital Leadership is a free interactive e-magazine with the mission to help individuals, leaders, and organizations find innovative approaches to maximize their human capital potential. We publish issues quarterly in August, November, February, and May. Take a look at the latest issue and let us know what you think. Thanks again for joining us for this episode of the Human Capital Innovations Podcast. I hope you stay healthy and safe and that you have a great week. Check out our new weekly LinkedIn newsletter, Alchemizing Human Capital, exploring industry trends via original research and interviews with executives and thought leaders from across the globe. We look forward to having you join us.